Good afternoon, everyone. Not a good afternoon. He's the only one person who like responds to me. All right. Well, good afternoon. I'm uh, Eckhart Grohl, in case you don't know me. I'm uh, the William E. and Florence E. Perry head of the School of Mechanical Engineering, as well as the Raleigh Professor of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, I'm excited to see so many of you here today for uh, our uh, Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture. It's uh, great to see you. Would like to uh, give you a little bit of an introduction to uh, what this is all about. But um, beginning in 2018, the Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series invites world-renowned faculty and professionals to Purdue Engineering to encourage uh, thought-provoking conversations and ideas with faculty and students regarding the grand challenges that we're facing and the opportunities in their fields. Uh, Besides presenting a lecture to a broad audience of faculty and graduate and undergraduate students, uh, they engage in an interactive panel with faculty and students as well. So after the lecture, we will actually have a panel uh, discussion, and I invite all of you uh, for the panel discussion as well. Uh, so with that, uh, the formal introduction of today's speaker uh, will be done by uh, Arvind Rahman. Uh, he is the Dean of Engineering, and he said uh, uh, I should keep the introduction very uh, short, but I would like to mention that uh, Arvin and I have been colleagues for many years, and I've known him well, and I'm so grateful for him to lead the college. So with that, Arvin, come on uh, up and do the introduction. Thank you. Good afternoon. A uh, warm welcome to everyone who's here in person and to everyone watching this online as we stream this event. Uh, yeah, it is my honor uh, to introduce today's distinguished lecturer, uh, Dr. Karen Wilcox. Uh, Dr. Wilcox uh, is the director of the Tinsley Odin Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences at UT Austin, where she also serves uh, as the Associate Vice President for Research, and she's also concurrently Professor of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics um, there at UT Austin. While she does that, she also finds time uh, to be an external faculty at the Santa Fe Institute. Um, now, Dr. Wilcox is internationally renowned for her work on reduced order modeling and scalable computational methods. And her research has had tremendous impact on the world. In particular, it has been incorporated into aircraft systems design and into environmental policy decision making. She has been the recipient of numerous recognitions. She's a fellow of AIAA, fellow of SIAM, fellow of the US Association of uh, Computational Mechanics, and most recently, member of the National Academy of Engineering. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Karen Wilcox to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, I did not think to unlock my computer before all that happened, so there we go. Put that into slideshow mode. All right, uh, it's really wonderful to be here, uh, to see some old friends, some younger friends, uh, and also to meet new, new people, new faculty, uh, and to talk with some of the, some of the students. Uh, I was trying to remember, Bill, when I was last at Purdue. It was so long ago that I can't even remember, but it's been at least a decade, I think. So, all right, so uh, today I'm really happy to uh, share with you some thoughts uh, and some glimpse of some of the work that we've been doing over the past years uh, with the long title here, From Reduced Order Modeling to Scientific Machine Learning, how computational science is enabling the design of next generation engineering systems. And uh, I really want to, through the talk, touch on these four things. I'm gonna start off uh, really motivating the work that we do through the lens of digital twins, which I'm sure is a phrase, is a topic uh, that many of you have been hearing, uh, thinking about what the excitement, the potential is around digital twins, but also what some of the challenges are around digital twins particularly when it comes to the complex systems that we as engineers think about. Uh, then I'm gonna dive in and uh, tell you just a little bit about some of the reduced order modeling work that we're doing, and particularly the, the method that we call operator inference. And I do have to warn you, there is gonna be a little bit of linear algebra ahead, uh, but really just try to convey you to you 
uh, some of those building blocks that are so, so essential to uh, realizing the potential of, of digital twins. Okay, so uh, let's, let's start out. So I have to ask, is there anyone here who has not heard the phrase digital twins? Yes, I've started to ask the question in the negative to get the more meaningful data collection. Uh, of course, this is uh, a hot topic. It's something that we're hearing uh, about in a number, a number of uh, venues. When I think about digital twins, and particularly when I communicate what is a digital twin to uh, an audience of non-experts, I often like to draw on the Apollo example, and for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, there's a blog from somebody at Siemens that kind of recounts the story of the Apollo 13 crisis, and it's kind of, it's, uh, I guess, fitting that we're sitting here in the, in the Armstrong building to talk about this. Uh, so Apollo 13, I think we're all familiar with that, thanks to Hollywood where uh, the spacecraft suffered a malfunction up in space, became damaged, became crippled, and of course the challenge was trying to figure out what to do and how to bring the astronauts back safely to Earth. So uh, the story goes that during the Apollo program, NASA, when they launched a spacecraft up in space, would also keep a physical simulator on the ground in Houston. And so during this Apollo 13 crisis, again the story goes that NASA were able to take the data from the physical spacecraft stuck up in space, feed it into the simulators, and these were physical simulators, these weren't digital simulators back, back then, 19, 1970, but physical, feed the data in, adapt the simulators, so now the simulator is mimicking what's going on in its physical counterpart, and run the what-if scenarios that ultimately informed the decision-making that brought the astronauts back home safely to Earth. So I really like this example, not because this is a digital twin, again, it was a physical simulator, because this example shows the power of what happens when you take models. And today we have very powerful mathematical models that are encoded as digital simulators. You take models and you combine that with data from a physical counterpart and not just data that's collected once, but data that is collected on an ongoing basis that is reflecting the changing nature, nature of a physical system, you put those together and then what that gives you is a very powerful way to drive decision making. So if we fast forward uh, today and we think about this, this sort of paradigm of models and data and driving better decisions, let me give you another completely different example uh, to think about and this is, uh, this is something that I've become uh, very interested in through some of our collaborative work at the Odin Institute. So radiotherapy regimens for high-grade gliomas. So this is planning uh, treatment for cancer patients, can cancer patients, and in particular in this example, these high-grade gliomas uh, is a form of brain cancer. So what we're looking at here and I always, and I, I know I'm being recorded, give the caveat, you're gonna hear an aerospace engineer's explanation of uh, oncology, but I'm speaking to mechanical and aerospace engineers, so that's okay. Um, what we're looking at here is what's called the standard of care, which is sort of the standards treatment that is given to patients today. So on day zero, the blue dot that you see there, that's uh, the, the MRI, the imaging that's taken, uh, the, the tumor, you can see they're depicted in the image. Then on day 20, the radiotherapy starts. And let's see, do I have a pointer on this thing? Whoop, no, maybe not. Uh, so you see there with the purple bars, that represents two grays per day of radiotherapy delivered. And we uh, deliver two days on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, five days a week and then nothing on Saturday and Sunday, and then two grades per day for the next week. And so then you can see weeks one, two, three, four, five, and six for a total of 60 grades. Uh, that's the end of the standard of care regimen. And then at some later time, uh, there's an assessment for what is called the time for progression, which is a prediction of the time at which the tumor will come back at a certain level uh, and uh, then a follow-up evaluation. And so again, this is the standard of care. This is uh, what is delivered to all patients. So now I want you to sort of think about that Apollo example, think about the notion of a digital twin and think about how one could move from this one-size-fits-all approach to treating cancer 
to, to uh, now bringing together models, data, this decision making, and moving towards uh, patient specific care. So uh, my group, my group of aerospace engineers and computational scientists have been collaborating with the oncologists at UT Austin and at uh, MD Anderson to, uh, to really think about how digital twin technology could make a difference in, in this kind of application. And what you see now depicted on the second line here is uh, you know, a notion of how a digital twin could, could uh, work in this situation. So again, day zero, we have an image. At day 20, we have another image. For the first week, we start with the standard of care, where we're delivering two grays per day. And then at the end of that, uh, that first week, there's another image taken, which is now data that can be fed into the mathematical models that are describing the tumor and its evolution and being used to calibrate those mathematical models uh, to a patient-specific model. To think about this idea of models, and we need the mathematical models that, uh, in this case, and, and by the way, and Bill, you may be interested to know this, the models of tumors are uh, reaction diffusion equations. So they're actually very sort of familiar. Although the physics, the biology is very different, they're the kinds of uh, partial differential equations that we see in other aspects of engineering. Combining that together with patient-specific data and really putting it all together and driving towards uh, this notion of a digital twin that can drive decision making. So whether you're thinking about uh, aerospace systems, aircraft, spacecraft, whether you're thinking about civil systems, buildings, bridges, and infrastructure, uh, or whether you're thinking about medicine, again, this idea of combining models and data through the process of data simulation, which is mathematically how we refer to putting the two together to uh, issue predictions and drive decisions, I think is very, very powerful. And that really is, uh, is at the heart of what is a digital twin. And uh, you know, I believe strongly that a digital twin builds on modeling and simulation, but really goes beyond it. Uh, that, and, and goes beyond it in the way I've described, where we have models, we have data, and we have this bi-directional interaction between the, the two. Uh, so that was one of the next graphics that, that was coming up. Um, and then the, the next ones, which I'll skip over in the in interest of time, was really, really just to highlight and to show you some of the work that's going on at the Odin Institute, the incredible interest in digital twins across engineering, across uh, climate sustainability, the natural sciences, and across medicine. And while all of these areas are really exciting, uh, when I look at the medicine field, this is where I see just incredible opportunities to bring the kinds of simulation uh, and computational techniques that engineers have been using uh, to, to really uh, influence things in, in medicine. All right, so we're gonna go over this one a little quickly, the elements of a digital twin. And uh, again, these, this was fleshing up some of the, the things that we have going on at the Odin Institute in manufacturing, uh, aircraft, spacecraft, uh, thinking about climate change really at a global scale with high fidelity simulations. In this case, this is Antarctica, and that's uh, Greenland and the interaction with the Atlantic currents. And then in uh, medicine, where we have two big centers within the Institute, one focused on computational oncology and the Willison Center, which uh, focuses on uh, cardiovascular work. So, okay, so the potential of digital twins, very, very exciting. And uh, sometimes I think that if you were to open the newspaper or to pick up a brochure from a simulation company, you might think that digital twins are a, are a done deal, that, that, that we really can create them. Uh, that's not the case, and I want to spend just the next, say, five minutes talking about some of the challenges of digital twins. Despite this great promise, uh, we're still not there yet. And I want to be very clear, this cancer example I gave, it's really aspirational to think about having a digital twin for every cancer patient that could provide these optimized treatments in the way that I, I described. This is a vision, but uh, we're not there yet. So why, why are we not there yet? Well, so the first thing is, um, if I were to ask you, and when I talk to people and they, we start talking about digital twins, to uh, think about conceptualizing a digital twin, what, what would you put in the middle of it? Anyone? What, what word would come to mind? What would you say? 
a model. Oh, good, Bill. Bill got the right answer. So Bill said model. That's probably because of his, his background. But for many people, they immediately go to the data. They think about the digital twin with the data being core and uh, you know, really having piles and piles of data and then probably having some kind of a numerical model wrapped around it, probably a machine learning model that will go to work on all these uh, on all the data that we have with some kind of analytics and drive decision making. And this may be a good model for a digital twin in, in some applications. And in fact, maybe in some of the most successful applications that we've seen of digital twins, particularly in the aerospace industry, where we've seen digital twins driving predictive maintenance for, let's say, aircraft engines, this is the situation we have, where there is tons and tons of data being generated by the engine as it's flying, and the decisions to be made are the decisions about when to make maintenance. These are relatively simple decisions that fall well within the realm of the data that, that are being collected across the, the fleet. So that, that way of thinking about a digital twin is absolutely valid for some problems. But there are many, many problems for which that is not, that is not enough. And that's because, as many of you I am sure know, it is really difficult to do predictive modeling for complex systems. And what do I mean? We discussed this at breakfast, this word predictive. A predictive model is one that can predict, can predict the future, can predict conditions that uh, haven't been seen, but not just predict them, predict them and get them right, or predict them and uh, have some knowledge of just how valid are those predictions? How good are those predictions? How much confidence do we have in those predictions as we, we uh, go to make decisions? And again, it's really, really hard to do predictive modeling for complex systems for all the reasons you see here. These systems are multiple, across multiple scales. Despite the fact that we now have exascale computing, we cannot even begin to resolve all the scales in a human or even in a complex material in an engineering system. Multi-scale, multi-physics, we're talking about high dimensional parameter spaces. Uh, there are computational constraints. Uh, sometimes we need to do these sort of, the, the, the data assimilation in, uh, in real time. Uh, there are limited data. This is a really, really important one to emphasize. And actually, if you take one or two things home with you today after my talk, this is one of them. Yes, we live in the age of big data, but as engineers and also in the medical world, we can almost never measure exactly what it is we want to know. We are almost always taking indirect measurements of something else and then trying to infer what it is we want to know. And not only are those measurements indirect, they're usually sparse. On an engineering system, they're expensive. They add weight to your aircraft, they add costs, they consume power, they do not come for free. And yes, the data may be big as measured in gigabytes, but it is uh, almost always limited, especially when you're talking about predicting the future or predicting conditions that you haven't seen. So yes, the data are big, but the data are limited. And then finally, uh, verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification are so important if we really want our modeling to be predictive. So these are all challenges, and uh, you know, I really land on the statement that big data alone is not enough. In some cases, it's enough, but for many of the problems that we as engineers care about, big data are not enough. So we really have to think about our digital twins as bringing in something more, and that something more is the models, the models that encode physical principles, conservation of mass, momentum, and energy, and all the other uh, pieces that, that we know uh, to hold. So let me give you another way to think about conceptualizing a digital twin, which is at the core, Bill stole the thunder, it's a mathematical model. And that mathematical model encodes the domain knowledge, even if it's imperfect domain knowledge, it encodes what we know about these systems. And again, I really want to emphasize that this notion of a mathematical model, this is what has let engineers predict the future, as in make predictions about the structure in this building and what loads it can take and how it needs to be designed to have the levels of safety and reliability that we have in the built world around us. Those are mathematical models encoded in, in computation. So this is not a new concept. 
a mathematical model encoded in numerics, of course with data, data fed in through the lens of models uh, and all of that wrapped around with, with decision making. Okay, so two ways to think about a digital twin. And again, I don't want to suggest that digital twins cannot be data centric. They absolutely can. But uh, I do want to emphasize that for many of maybe the, the uh, high impact applications of digital twins in engineering and in medicine uh, in particular, we need the models to be at the center of it all. Okay, so that's wonderful. We say go off and do it, but there's a big catch. And that big catch is that these mathematical models, which by the way, in many situations come to us in the form of partial differential equations. What are partial differential equations? They're equations that describe quantities that evolve in space and time. And of course, that's not all of it. There are other kinds of mathematical models, uh, discrete phenomena that are, that are important. But just as one example, these physics-based models are powerful. They let us predict the future. But the catch is that they are really, really expensive to solve because by the time you have discretized this mathematical model and turned it into a simulation capability, you might have something like this example of a simulation, a combustion simulation of a, of a, of a rocket engine, a simulation that at full scale, the scale of a full engine might take weeks or even months on a supercomputer. And you don't want to do just one simulation. You want to do many, many, many simulations. And you want to have a digital twin that is assimilating data and updating these simulations. And so the expense of these physics-based models is a, is a real barrier to uh, having them at the core of, of a digital twin. OK, so that leads us into uh, reduced order modeling, which really is a critical enabler for accelerating predictive computations. We need to make those predictive computations. These are the mathematical models that we know are imperfect, but we trust them to give us predictions that can drive decisions, that can be validated and can be drive decisions. We need to make them faster so that these mathematical models can be the core of a digital twin or even can be just the core of, of uh, engineering design. So what is, what is reduced order modeling? Uh, Reduced order modeling is, uh, an old, is an old topic. Um, it's a field that's been around for several decades. And the general idea is shown here. And I'm showing to the students here, I hope you uh, sort of recognize your state space form, the good old x dot equal ax plus bu. Right? This is sort of a schematic of that. On the left is a high fidelity physics-based simulation. By the time you've taken your governing equations, whether they're partial differential equations or whatever they are, and discretize them, you're going to end up with some kind of a large system to solve. And that system will have millions or maybe even billions of degrees of freedom because, again, we're talking about discretization in space and ultimately in time. And again, that, uh, that simulation might take minutes, hours, days, maybe weeks, maybe months to really solve at the scale of a full system where we're uh, targeting for digital twins. So the idea is, can we come up with a reduced order model there on the right? The reduced order model is, first of all, much smaller in dimension. So instead of having millions of degrees of freedom, it has maybe tens or hundreds. Uh, and importantly, instead of taking hours or days to solve it, it takes seconds, maybe fractions of, of seconds. And uh, of course, we can come up with reduced order models. But the big question is, can we say something about those reduced order models and how good they are? how predictive they are, so that we could actually start to use them with confidence in our design or in our uh, design task or our digital twin task. A broader class of problems is surrogate modeling. Right? So surrogate modeling is the process of coming up with approximate models, of which I would say machine learning approaches are one way to come up with surrogates. Reduced order models tend to follow a particular um, process. That process is, first of all, to generate training data, meaning that we have to solve or somehow query this large high fidelity system to generate some kind of representative data. In the reduced order modeling world, we refer to those as snapshots. So these are going to be solutions, pressure fields, temperature fields, velocity fields that represent the, the system uh, at high fidelity. The second step is to identify some kind of structure. <coughs> and the structure that we're looking for 
is some kind of structure that is going to be amenable to this compact, low-dimensional representation in the reduced model, many of the methods, not all of them, but many of the methods will look for a low-dimensional basis that uh, describes a low-dimensional subspace. So the geometric picture in your head is, here's that rocket combustion simulation. There are millions of degrees of freedom. That's a million-dimensional state space. What we're looking for is a low dimensional subspace, maybe a hundred dimensional subspace that cuts through that vast high dimensional state space and is a subspace on which the dynamic, uh, the, the dominant dynamics really evolve. So identifying structure. And then the third step is the reduction step where we go back to the physics. And I wrote here partial differential equations because that's what we deal with. We go back to the physics. We take the phys physics uh, governing equations and uh, project them mathematically onto the low dimensional subspace. And uh, I'll show that in, in a little bit of math in a second. And again, I just wanna pause here and note that if I had stopped at step two, we could have been talking about a machine learning method, right? Generate training data and then identify structure, sort of fit some kind of an input output map where I think reduced order modeling and black box machine learning really deviate is in this third step where we go back to the physics, and even though now we are talking about an approximate model, we are injecting the governing equations back in through their projection onto this low dimensional subspace. And by the way, when you do that, if you do it in responsible ways and you are working with nice classes of systems, particularly linear systems, you can come up with reduced order models with rigorous guarantees error bounds in some cases, error estimators in other cases that again give you a sense when you use the reduced order model to make predictions for conditions that you didn't see in training, just how good is it going to be? Now we can't do that for all systems, uh, particularly in the nonlinear case, but in some cases we can get those rigorous guarantees. And why are there guarantees? It's again because the physics is, is injected. Yeah. So you're talking about disentangling the representation, the, lo the lower order manifold that you're representing the, uh, the structure as. You're talking about disentangling the different parts of the network with different, let's say, output parameters. So is that okay. Well, there is no network, and uh, there is not necessarily a network. But as um, you train with the function call, are you talking about disentangling the representation by some parameter that you can control? You know, let's let's do the linear algebra, and then maybe we can see if your question is 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 answered. Okay, so. Um, Again, start with a physics-based model. Do not try to read the partial differential equations unless, unless your name is Professor Anderson. Uh, so just, again, to make it more concrete, the governing equations for that reacting flow that you saw, uh, it's the Navier-Stokes equations, conservation of mass, momentum, and energy, and then the governing conservation laws for the chemical species. And again, uh, people who are expert in these things work their magic and turn this mathematical model into a numerical model that is solved with high performance computing. And just to make things kind of clean and a little bit more concrete uh, to, the, to the question that was just asked, I'm gonna work with the form that you maybe can see there at the bottom of the slide, which is x dot equal ax plus bu plus f of x and u. So sort of the standard linear state space form with uh, all the nonlinear terms just uh, just grouped there in, in, in F. And what is X here? These are now the discretized states. So we're solving for the pressures, the temperatures, the velocities, the chemical species, but now instead of being infinite dimensional fields, these are discretized over some kind of grid, and so there are millions of degrees of freedom in this, this system. We can write it down nicely on this PowerPoint slide, but this is a massive, system, and of course there are all kinds of complexities that go into that discretization. Okay, but what's, what's the kind of the point of showing you these equations? So I want you to, to uh, think first of all, just think about a linear system. So a big linear system, time-dependent time system, x dot equal ax plus bu, and again, x is a very big, let's think million dimensional state vector. So let's think about those steps of reduced order modeling. We said we would look for a low dimensional subspace. In other words, we would approximate our very high dimensional state X in a low dimensional basis, uh, in a low dimensional subspace represented by the basis V. So V here has got dimension millions uh, of rows, but it's only got R columns. Let's say it's got 100 degrees of freedom 
And now the X hats are the modal coordinates. They're the expressions of my unknowns in this uh, low dimensional basis. So here's an approximation. We can substitute it into the governing equations. Now we have millions of equations to satisfy. Uh, we have only a handful of degrees of freedom, so we are not going to, to be able to satisfy all those equations. We have a residual. This is the projection step. And again, just keeping things very simple for those who are not familiar with these methods. What does projection mean? It means imposing an orthogonality condition. And uh, it takes the form you see there. The end of the story and the thing that is important is that the reduced order model, which you see at the bottom, x hat dot equals a hat x hat plus b hat u, has the same form as the system we started with, x dot equal ax plus b u. Now, instead of solving for a million states, we're going to solve for just r of them, tens or hundreds. And the matrices a hat and b hat are nothing but the projections. You can see them over there on the right. They're the projections of the big matrices onto the low dimensional subspace. So that's a linear, uh, a linear system. And just hold that thought. The reduced order model, if you derive the model through projection onto a linear subspace in this way, the reduced model in the linear case has the same form as the one we started with. Okay? The same is true if we were to take a quadratic model. So now x dot equal ax plus bu. And now let's introduce a quadratic term. What does it mean, quadratic term? Think of Navier-Stokes, u du dx. It's quadratic in velocity. Right? Or a term that involves pressure and velocity is quadratic. So we're going to introduce quadratic terms, which again show up because they are given to us by the governing laws of nature. If you were to go through the same thought process, approximate the state in a low dimensional subspace, project, you would get a uh, reduced order model that now is operating in this low dimensional subspace, but it has the same form as the system we started with. Okay, so why, why do I emphasize this preservation of form? I'm writing it as linear algebra, because that's the way I like to think of it. But the fact that we have an A matrix, we have a linear term, the fact that we may have that H operator, the quadratic term, that's not a coincidence. That's coming because of the governing laws of nature, right? When you write down conservation of mass, you have a linear equation. When you write down conservation of momentum, uh, depending on the system that you're working with, you're going to have linear terms. You might have linear diffusion terms, mu d, d by d, d, second derivative of velocity. It's linear in velocity. Uh, you might have quadratic terms. You might have cubic. Yes, you may have nonlinear terms, and that's a, a topic of another talk. But the structure in the model is there because of the physics. And so if your approximation preserves the structure, your approximation is doing something that is aligned with the physics. And I think this is a really central idea as we start to move towards surrogate models that embed physical structure, embed physical constraints, uh, and, and move towards uh, being, being predictive. OK, so that's all, all great. And you say, oh, this is wonderful. Why is the whole world not using uh, reduced order models? Because Karen mentioned that this is an old field that's been around for decades. And you know, the answer is that reduced order models have had some impact in some, some areas and some areas of industry. But they have not seen anything close to the adoption that we're seeing with things like machine learning. And you could ask, why is that? And I think the main reason is they're just too difficult to, to implement, right? I'm talking about A matrices and H's and higher order terms, and now I'm talking about going into a code. And by the way, if you're Boeing, that code is a Fortran code that has been started to be written decades ago that is thousands and thousands of lines of code, and someone's now telling you you need to find these matrices and these operators, and then you need to project them. It's just, just too complicated. Uh, and you know this well because we battled with, a, with, a, with an Air Force code over, over that. So that then brings us to uh, the work that we've been doing in uh, operator inference, which is to say we said we're trying to come up with approximate models. We have all this beautiful theory from classical model reduction that says if you start with a physics-based model, if you start with what you know and go from there, there's a lot of structure you can embed, and by embedding structure, you can then uh, have theory and guarantees and predictive power that comes along with it. But on the other side, you have machine learning methods that are so attractive 
because all you have to do is run those giant codes and collect data and then set the machine learning to work on it. You maybe need to know how to, how to run the code, but you certainly don't need to go into the source code and extract all these operators. That non-intrusive nature of machine learning, I think is one of the reasons that it has seen so much, so much adoption. So we asked the question, can we, can we try to get the best of both worlds? Can we bring the theory and the perspective of model reduction and put that together with a non-intrusive view uh, that comes from machine learning and uh, learn predictive reduced models? And so uh, the answer is yes, we can do that. And that's the method that uh, we call, uh, call operator inference, where again, we go back to this observation that says, if you are going to get the reduced model through projection, and today I'm talking about projection on a linear subspace, it preserves the structure. So said another way, if I know the governing equations I'm solving, and I also should make a comment, there are classes of problems where we don't know the governing equations and the job is to discover the physics. And that is a really important class of problems, especially in biological applications. I, as an aerospace engineer, are talking about problems where I don't need to discover the physics because I know what it is. I mean, models may be imperfect, but I believe in conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. I have to say, I sometimes tell my children. Reminds me of Homer Simpson saying, in this law, we obey the second law, law of thermodynamics. If you guys have seen that episode. Okay, so in situations where we have a physical model that we trust enough, and it's just too expensive, we know what the physics are, we don't have to discover them, and through this lens of classical model reduction, we know the form of the reduced models we should be looking for. So again, I really want to emphasize this point. The form of the model that we're looking for is going to be inspired by the theory, but we are not going to derive the models by the theory, by the, that sort of uh, intrusive projection-based approach. Instead, what we're going to do is grab the data and machine learning style, we are going to learn we're going to solve an inverse problem to learn the operators of a structured form of a reduced model where the structured form of the model was presented to us by the, by the physics. Okay, so that's operator inference. You're going to start with a physics-based model. You're going to use this lens of projection. You're going to write down on a piece of paper, I am looking for a reduced model that has this form, the form dictated by the physics, and then you're going to pick up a machine learning viewpoint and say, can I take uh, data now from training data from these simulations? Or by the way, we could also be taking data from experimental simulations, throwing it in the pot and learning the reduced order model, which is describing the evolution of the coordinates on this uh, reduced order subspace. And uh, as with all great things in life, it's all just linear algebra. It's something else I tell my kids uh, all the time. My kids. Think, think I'm a little crazy. Yeah. Loves you. <laughs> That's right. They, they're required to love me. That's right. Uh, it's all just linear algebra. This notion of learning the operators amounts to the uh, optimization problem that you see here. So the first thing, and for the example uh, here, we are learning a reduced sort of model that has quadratic form. And uh, again, I said it was a topic for another talk. It turns out there are many, many nonlinear partial differential equations that you can actually write in quadratic form through clever manipulations of the variables. But let's think of this example of quadratic form. So we're going to solve an optimization problem to find the operators, the matrices A hat, B hat, and H hat. Those are the matrices, the operators of the uh, reduced order model. We are driving it with data that comes from the simulation. And you see these, these X hat here, these uh, X hats here. This is the data from the high fidelity model, but projected onto the, the low dimensional manif uh, the lo low dimensional subspace, which is a very easy matrix vector multiply operation. Uh, and what are we doing here? <clears throat> we are minimizing the residual, which is, in other words, is we're taking the data from the high fidelity code, we're substituting it into the form of the reduced model, and then we're saying minimize the, the sort of the fit to that model form, and by posing it in this minimum residual sense, you can see that the things in blue are the things we know, those are the data, and the things we are solving for, the A hat, the H hat, and the B hat, they're all linear. So this is nothing but a linear least squares problem, right? It's a linear least squares problem at the, at the end of the day. 
Now, of course, there are many uh, important details that I'm glossing over in a talk like this. Regularization is really important. This question of ill posedness of this, this uh, problem. Uh, Benjamin Peerstopper, my uh, former postdoc, and actually um, the original paper there was in 2016 uh, with Benjamin, had some really nice uh, more recent theoretical work where he shows provable recovery um, of the intrusive reduced model. Why is that important? Remember, I said that those intrusive methods come with, uh, with a bunch of theory. And so if you can recover the intrusive reduced model, you can uh, get a window into some of those, those guarantees. OK, a few things to emphasize. It's entirely non-intrusive. All you have to do is generate the snapshots from high fidelity simulation or from an experiment. So start with the data set, compute the proper orthogonal decomposition basis. That's the way we identify this low dimensional subspace. That is nothing but SVD. SVD at big scale, but it's nothing but SVD on this set of snapshots. Compute the low dimensional representation. That's nothing but a matrix vector multiply and then solve the linear least squares problem to come up with the reduced operators. You never have to touch anything about the high fidelity model or the experiment that, you are, um, that you're trying to approximate. So it really is trying, again, to get the best of both worlds. Now, of course, we are giving up some of the theory to go non-intrusive like this, but uh, what's, I think, really important is that we are keeping the physics we are, uh, we are, we are embedding, embedding the physics. So to the young people out there, before you reach for your neural network, you need to ask yourself, do you know more about the system you're trying to approximate? Is there a structure that may be more amenable to the physics and may give you more guarantees? Then the last note to mention is that everything, because it's all linear algebra, everything here is very, very scalable. And uh, my former postdoc, Yonit Farkas, has been working on a distributed algorithm of this where you can take now very, very large scale snapshots, uh, distribute them across processes, and do all of these computations at really, really large scale. So we really could start to learn reduced sort of models uh, at, the, at, the, at the larger scale. And you'll see a little bit of this in the results. OK, so in the last, um, the last few minutes, I um, want to show you just one example. Uh, and this is actually work that we've been doing under an Air Force Center of Excellence. Uh, where uh, uh, Bill is a, a collaborator and also under another contract working closely with uh, the Air Force Research Lab. Uh, these results and this work is uh, Yonit Farkas's work. Yonit uh, has been a postdoc in my group and he has just started as an assistant professor at Virginia Tech. So uh, you can see the, the setup here. So we're, uh, in this case, we're modeling a rotating detonation rocket engine. Uh, so the high fidelity model here is LES simulations of the reactive viscous 3D Navier-Stokes equations. And these are horribly, horribly, horribly expensive simulations. Um, and I really want to emphasize that we, UT Austin, we don't even touch the code. AFRL is doing all the simulations, all the CFD simulations, and generating the data. And we are interacting with them at the level of the data. So it really is truly non-intrusive. And I also want to emphasize that as much as you know, we would love to do intrusive reduced models, it's just not practical, practical to create reduced order models with this kind of complexity of, of uh, code, uh, especially in commercial, commercial and legacy codes. OK, so there are those, those governing equations again. So let's walk through the steps. So the first step, again, is generate the training data. And again, we, we're not even doing this part of it. The AFRL is doing this part of it. Um, again, just to give you a sense of the scale of this problem, the LES simulation, we can simulate, well, they are simulating for two milliseconds. And by the way, the desire is to be able to simulate for much longer, but the computations are just too expensive. Uh, the full engine has 136 million degrees of freedom in the spatial discretization. And then you can see there just some of the, the CPU hours uh, that it takes to generate two milliseconds, two milliseconds worth of, of data. Um, turns out the, uh, and this, by the way, is a, another sort of really interesting thing I've come to appreciate. All this effort and energy goes into running these huge simulations, these huge simulations, but then the data are so big that people can't store them. And so they don't even store all the data that comes out. The data that is actually available are dramatically downsampled, both in space and in time. 
And I think this in itself is a really sort of interesting question for those of us who are, uh, are working in these areas. So we end up having 501 snapshots, so that's 501 time in instance, uh, and it's also uh, downsampled in space to a 4 million degree of freedom grid. Right? There are 18, we use transformations, 18 state variables in our model, so pressure, temperature, velocities, chemical species. So it's 18 times 4, 72 million degrees of freedom, in a, even in the downsampled, and we have 500 data points. And yes, you could fit a neural network to this data, but you really would have to stop and think about how many degrees of freedom you have to fit and how much information you really have to fit it and whether you would have anything that would be uh, predictive in, in any sense, maybe by the time you're done training your hyperparameters. Okay, so we have our training data uh, snapshot matrix is 76 million by, uh, we use 375 snapshots for training. We're gonna keep the rest back to see how the, the method goes. We now come in, compute the POD basis. Again, at this point, it's linear algebra. Uh, again, there's a really important details about scaling, um, especially in a problem with so many different physical quantities. You have to be very careful. Uh, we compute the singular value that define the, the singular values and the singular vectors define that low dimensional subspace. Um, the singular values are an indication to you of just how reduced your reduced order model can be. I always tell my students, don't ever walk into my office without a, a plot of singular values in your hand. The singular values tell you so much about the complexity of the problem, the complexity of the data set you're working with, and just how much you could expect to, to reduce it. Um, Yonet has been uh, working all of this in parallel, and Frontera, which is the, um, the NSF leadership machine, it's the, the uh, fastest supercomputer on an academic cam campus in the country at UT Austin. Uh, he's scaled all this up to, uh, to more than a thousand uh, processing units and it's, it's very scalable. Okay, so we've computed the low dimensional subspace. Now we can infer the reduced model. Again, at this point, it's nothing but, but uh, linear algebra. So let me show you uh, just a few um, sort of snapshots of what it is we can do. And again, if you take anything away from this talk, the next sentence I'm gonna say you should take away, which is, there is no magic. Despite what you might read in the newspapers or even some academic papers, there is no magic. You do not get to go from 76 million degrees of freedom down to 24 degrees of freedom and get perfect solutions. And if anybody tells you they can do that, you should become very, very skeptical. Uh, the reduced order model has 24 degrees of freedom. It is completely decoupled from the CFD. It is gonna run in a fraction of a second, really, really fast. The CFD even downsampled 76 million degrees of freedom. You saw how, how expensive that is. You are not going to get everything. There is no magic. What you're looking at here are uh, three different uh, locations in this engine, one close to the injectors, one within the detonation region and one downstream of the, um, the detonation region. We're looking at pressure traces with the CFD in black and the reduced order model in orange. And what you see is the reduced order model kind of gets it right. It gets the right frequency. It sort of gets the right amplitude. It gets the bulk, the coarse behavior really pretty amazingly well. Uh, but it does not get the details, does not get the high frequency either in time or space as you would expect going from 76 million down to 24 degrees of freedom. And I should say the top row there is uh, at the end of the training horizon and the bottom three rows are um, now moving out into the simulations well uh, beyond the, the training regime. Uh, it's kind of hard to visualize these kinds of results, but I'll say I think this problem is really at a scale, size, and complexity of physics that goes beyond what people have been able to do with reduced order modeling and getting this kind of, uh, of predictive performance. Uh, just a few more ways. Again, it's very, very hard to visualize. This is another really important area of research is visualization of all the incredible stuff that we are computing. Uh, what you're looking at here now, uh, time is going from left to right, so training in the first column, beyond training in the, the last three columns. On the top, the CFD uh, sort of full color solutions of pressure, and then uh, picking out a narrow band of pressure with those red contours, 
the full CFD and the reduced order model. And again, this is to emphasize there is no magic. The reduced order model is not going to get it perfectly. But what you're seeing is that the reduced order model is doing a really good job of predicting kind of the, the large scale, um, the, the general dynamics of what's going on. And again, we're working very closely with the Air Force to understand what is a designer looking for? What would a designer want to see being predicted well in a reduced order model so that this reduced order model could be useful in running many, many simulations in support of design uh, as opposed to one high fidelity simulation that would take, would take weeks. So we're feeling uh, really happy, happy with these, these results. Okay, let me, oh, I've got one minute just to, uh, just to close up. So again, just to summarize our take on operator inference, again, given a physical, natural system with known governing equations and a set of data, infer a reduced model. At the end of the day, it is all linear algebra. It is all linear algebra. There's some, of course, nonlinearity in the physics. We use the physics to define the structured form of the model. We use the theory and the lens of projection-based model reduction to cast the inference in reduced coordinates. We use inverse theory to analyze the structure of the inverse problem to understand what rights, how big of a reduced order model can we solve, what guarantees can we make about this inference problem. And then we use numerical linear algebra to, to achieve uh, efficient scalable algorithms. And I would encourage you all to not take away operator inference, but take away this general principle that as we start talking about machine learning and how we combine physics-based modeling and machine learning to make sure that we're not just slapping physics into a loss function as a penalty term and hoping that somehow the neural net is matching the physics, but to really think about the physics and what structure that defines and bringing the physics in as a central part of the models that we bring. Um, of course, there are a range of use cases. Um, there are many cases, and to go back to what I said earlier, where you have tons of data and where black box machine learning is going to get you to what you need. There are other cases where you can really afford to go a more mathematical route, to go uh, reduce order modeling. We've really been asking the questions as to how we can, can land in the middle. And then lastly, I just want to conclude and just uh, pop up uh, a couple of references. So Boris and uh, Benjamin, who are now uh, both faculty members, both former postdocs, uh, and worked on uh, a number of the work that I showed here. We uh, recently just authored a paper and annual review of fluid mechanics that talks about these operator inference problems. It just came out uh, last month. Uh, Yonit, there I mentioned him and his work with the combustion uh, is in the final stages of submitting a journal paper as soon as his, his advisor gets around to the final round of edits. Um, I didn't have time to talk about it today, but I talked, I emphasized the structure that's preserved through the linear subspace. Uh, we have some, I think, really exciting work uh, together with Rudy Heelan, who's a postdoc in my group, in uh, looking at quadratic manifolds so that you have a richer approximation space. And it turns out that many of the things that I said about preserving structure and knowing the form of the reduced model carry over if you work into a, if you move from a linear subspace into a quadratic manifold. So uh, again, before you reach for the neural network, there's so much fertile ground uh, in the middle there with more structured uh, yet powerful approximations. And then lastly, again, it was hard to know what to talk about. I'm really excited about the work that we're doing in Digital Twins. Uh, we've been working with probabilistic graphical models, really emphasizing the role of uncertainty quantification in Digital Twins. And uh, Anaban in particular has been leading the charge on our collaboration with the oncologists where we have taken the foundational methods that we developed for uh, structural health monitoring digital twin for an unmanned aerial vehicle and brought them over to that cancer setting that I uh, motivated in the, in the beginning. All right, uh, I'd also like to thank the funding sources and then a very last plea, which is, uh, if you haven't seen this, my son is on a campaign. It, right, and you must feel sorry for my son because you've already heard that he is subjected to all these, this, um, I don't know, um, conditioning about linear algebra. We are almost at a million views on the TED Talk. So if you haven't watched the TED Talk, please watch it. Um, uh, but in all, in all seriousness, again, I think a really important thing that we as engineers, as computational scientists, as people 
uh, who come from a background of physics-based modeling have to do is to make what we do accessible to the public and talk about the importance of uh, models together with data so that it's not just AI and machine learning all the time, but it's AI and machine learning together with the incredibly powerful, rich base we have of physics-based simulation, optimization, design, and control. And uh, I really tried to do that in that, in that TED talk. Okay, so with that, um, I want to thank you all for coming and for listening to me talk when there were no slides. And I guess uh, we'll have time just for a couple questions. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you for answering my question. Um, I just had a quick question about the advantages of using digital data versus the physical experimental data to actually base your um, the reduced order modeling on and then eventually the digital twin. Because um, I noticed when we were talking about the rotational detonation engine, we only got a couple of microseconds of That's right. data versus, is it certain like the, um, the amount of, like, you would get more time using a physical simulation yeah. versus less fidelity on the, uh, so, on the actual data? So, um, you know, I think, I think that the festival is a real opportunity space, which is simulation data and experimental data. And maybe you have a sense, at least in the way we're approaching the problem, there is no reason why we couldn't put the two together. And I think this is, this is a very good question to ask for this example. The simulations are so expensive and you had such a tiny window in through the simulation data. But if you were to talk to an experimentalist, you would uh, hear from them that in this particular example, the experiments are expensive and you know, the kinds of data that you can collect are extremely limited as well. And you know, one of the nice things about the simulation data is that you get the full, full state, right? We get pressure and temperature everywhere. And again, talk to an experimentalist. Yes, you can have things like PIV, part, part of, particle image velocimetry um, techniques that give you fields, but they're not going to give you sort of this clean data everywhere like you'll get from a simulation. Now, of course, the experiment is the real world, except that it also isn't the real world. It's also a surrogate of the real world. The simulation is probably even less the real world. So there are real strengths, pros and cons to each. And I think moving towards figuring out how you can leverage both simulation and experimental data and maybe even close the loop so that your understanding of these very expensive simulations and these very expensive experiments, which are the ones that you should run to best inform uh, the kinds of models or ultimately the kinds of decisions you want to make. Yeah. We're very, we're very interested in uh, also using experimental data. But again, I guess this is my naivety as a computational person. I just sort of assumed that they measured pressure and temperature and then you start reading the papers and they're measuring things that I have never heard of. Um, and then I'll ask, you know, how, and I don't even want to start saying them because I'm probably going to pronounce the words wrong, but these luminescence, uh, how, like, how does that relate to temperature? And then it turns out it's like a very complicated relationship. And so you would have to build that in. Um, so we often think of experiments of, of being measurements of just what we want. They almost never are. But this in itself is a, a really interesting opportunity. And now the experimentalist can c c correct me. <laughs> Wahid. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk again. Uh, so in the example that you gave, the full order model had 76 million degrees of freedom, and the reduced one had 24. 24. And I think that's uh, sort of an extreme case, right? But uh, I was wondering how the accuracy of the reduced order model scale with uh, order. Yeah. Uh, so, so, um, so one thing I, I sort of skipped over, I was going fast at that point, is because we only had, we had 500 snapshots and we used 375 snapshots for training, we, and uh, again, I'm, so, I'm sorry if they're machine learning people here and you're feeling attacked, but um, we don't believe that you can fit more parameters than you have data points because that's an underdetermined system. And yes, you can do it and you can get an answer, but it's not real. And so our size of the reduced model is actually limited by the amount of data that we have. We could fit bigger reduced models, but again, it's not real. You don't have the data to inform, uh, and we're, forgetting, we're fitting quadratic reduced models, so we need 
you know, 24 de degrees of freedom for the linear term and then something that scales with 24 squared for the quadratic term, which is why we come up against that limit of 24. So we are in the low data regime for this kind of application. Um, of course, if you had more data, you could fit a, a, a bigger reduced model and you're sort of asking the question, how does the accuracy scale? Uh, you, can, you can get more and more, but even though it's an extreme example, I think it's a really good example of what you get with reduced modeling, which is you do not get the fine scale detail. You're not going to get all the, and if you were to, to dive into those CFD pictures and see the very fine scale detail of what's going on in the pressure and the temperature fields, you don't, you're not going to get that. And if you do get it, you probably have a reduced model that's overfit and will not predict what goes on later. But what you can get are these sort of lower, larger spatial structures. You can get the frequencies, you can get the amplitudes. You can get enough for it to be useful in uh, some kind of a setting, particularly when combined maybe with real-time data and a digital twin. Um, so I know I'm not really exactly answering your question, but I think it is more than just making the reduced order models big. And again, we could, we could probably fit the data exactly but you would be looking at fits by hyperparameters. You wouldn't actually be looking at a reduced sort of model. And I think this is something to be very, very careful with, with neural networks, is what you're looking at. Okay, maybe one more question. Yeah, so I guess I'm, I'm going to ask about the linear algebra problem, right? So you, when you solve for the A hat, B hat, you assume you have a unique solution because it's linear or quadratic. What happens in general in solid mechanics is that this A and B matrix are going to depend on X too. Right. And there you don't know if you have a unique solution, right, or, or not, and what yeah. do you do? So, um, so I, didn't, I didn't really talk today at all about nonlinear problems other than the ones that had the particular quadratic form. Uh, so, you know, first to, to say something I said earlier, which is it actually turns out that there are clever tricks you can play with the variables that you use in the reduced model that allow you to write many, many systems in quadratic form, even though the partial, like the, the governing equations are not. And that's because we can, we can um, sort of play games with what we're representing in the reduced model state. So there are many cases, transformations that can get around that. Um, and then there are other cases where you cannot get around it or, with, or getting around it causes you to end up with algebraic equations and all other things that create a mess. And these are some of the things that we are looking at. Uh, you can also sort of go through the notional approach that I, I laid out, but then you don't get this nice, clean, linear least squares problem at the end. You end up with a nonlinear problem. And then you could still uh, solve an optimization problem to find a reduced model. You might not have a unique solution. You might not be able to guarantee. Um, so yes, ab ab absolutely. And, and, and for sure, there are classes of, and I should also say there are classes of problems that are not amenable to approximation in a low dimensional subspace or a low dimensional manifold like I've described today. And, those are and there are classes of problems for which a neural network approximation that maps many to many in a very sort of compositional and hierarchical way is the right approximation technique. But there are also many classes of problems that are amenable to these kinds of approaches. And so we shouldn't, we shouldn't reach for the neural network before we've thought through linear approximation quadratic manifolds. Wonderful. Thank you very much again uh, for giving us a great presentation and being here today. Uh, so help me please uh, thank you uh, to uh, Dr. Karen Wilcox.